Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. It is especially wonderful that you're with us considering the state of the world in our society, particularly over the past few weeks. I hope that all of you have taken moments of necessary self-care, education, activism, philanthropy, work, and rest to get through these times. And I wanna send love, light, support, and wisdom your way as we experience the changes happening via COVID-19 and meeting the goals of the Black Lives Matter movement by addressing police brutality and systemic racism. My name is Nicole Young and I am the creator of Straw Dog Writers Guild's Emerging Writers Fellowship Program. Today marks a special occasion, one that wouldn't have been made possible without your support. We're officially launching the Emerging Writers Fellowship Program. Huge kudos and thank yous to everyone who has either donated, asked others to contribute, shared links and associated promo, sat in meetings to discuss program details, submitted an application, served as judges, and continue to support this initiative. The Emerging Writers Fellowship Program began only as an idea about a year and a half ago when I was frustrated at not getting the support I needed around my own work. I entered countless writing contests only to get rejected and trying to pay to attend writing workshops to help polish my work became next to impossible due to either the costs associated or the time I would have to take off work. These are things not unique to writers, but it's even more so prevalent for writers of marginalized communities who cannot afford to attend prominent MFA programs or pay for expensive master classes and workshops. For those not in the know, many of the artists whose concerts, plays, performances, albums, paintings, photographs, and books you either attend or purchase have a separate full-time job in a very different industry as we're not in a place as a society for us to be able to pursue this type of work as a sole income. And for many of us, we work these jobs to be able to produce our own work, paying for studio rental time, duplications, websites, etc. I created this program so other writers of similar circumstances following me didn't have to share in the same struggle. I wanted to make the path for them much easier. The Emerging Writers Fellowship Program is for women and gender non-binary writers of color based in Berkshire, Franklin, Hamden, or Hampshire County who has yet to publish their first book. During the fellowship year, which is 12 calendar months, the fellow receives a stipend, mentor support in areas such as craft, learning about publishing, or creating a brand for themselves, and time to devote to finishing a writing project. The program lasts for one calendar year and will be available every two years. We're anticipating the next cycle, which will take place in 2022, to support either a writer who focuses on fiction or creative nonfiction. The Emerging Writers Fellowship Program is an initiative of Straw Dog Writers Guild and our Social Justice Writing Committee, chaired by author Ellen Mirapol. Straw Dog Writers Guild supports writers of all stages and all genres, who are based in the four counties of Western Massachusetts through free or low cost craft sessions, free events, readings, open mics, and a plethora of unique benefits to our members. To learn more about Straw Dog and how to become a member, please visit our website at www.strawdogwriters.org. Tonight's event features a conversation with this year's fellow poet performer Amina Jordan Mendez, facilitated by singer songwriter, scholar, poet, educator, and activist Dr. Diana Alvarez, who is serving as one of Amina's mentors and was one of this year's judges. A little bit about both of our guests before we turn over to their discussion. Writing poetry since childhood and called to perform by community, family, and their ancestors. Amina Nia Ellipsis Jordan Mendez lives for passion and healing. Born and raised in a predominantly white college town of Western Massachusetts, Amina grew up a rebel, black, fat, queer, and existing. Inviting the challenge, she chose to live out loud, swim with her hair out, throw her weight around, question and confront. Now a focused poet performer, their hands are busy rooting themselves in intergenerational healing of their lineage, embracing the pain, hostility, 
pleasure and pride of blossoming into a poet she can look up to. Amina Nia Ellipsis Jordan Mendez is tender, grateful, angry, loving, and growing. They are currently attending workshops as they come and fitting art within their busy schedule of work and self-care, addressing mental health and traumas. Born to a first-generation Panamanian mother and an army brat Southern black father, she is exploring a defining home in her body, in her life, and in this world. Amina currently is based in Holyoke, Massachusetts. I've known Amina since they were in high school, involved with New World Theater's Project 2050 and serving as an intern in our office. I'll never forget one of the first times I heard them take the stage. We were at an event during our time in Washington, D.C. for the International Spoken Word Competition, Brave New Voices. Amina took the mic and snatched edges and stole lots of hearts. Their work is especially brave and a well-focused lens into today's issues. When I thought of this program, this is the type of writer I had in mind for it, and I was so proud to have been able to offer this type of opportunity to Amina. Dr. Diana Alvarez is a singer, songwriter, poet, composer, filmmaker, educator, scholar, whose fierce Chicana Chicona voice creates a gripping atmosphere that audiences call transcendent. Alvarez's soulful Spanglish songs exalt queer love and liberation and are drawn from her origins in the borderlands of South Texas, where she grew up singing to the Gulf of Mexico. In her music, Alvarez grapples with her solo migration to the Northeast as a means to shift the tides of oppression in her family and beyond. Her songs are offering for chosen familia and honor the in-betweenness of culture, identity, and language. Dr. Alvarez is the composer and filmmaker behind the multimedia performance Quiero Volver at Chicanex Ritual Opera. Described by the press as a visually and acoustically stunning performance meant to honor women, non-binary, and gender queer people of color, Quiero Volver features Alvarez's original music, sonic text scores, a poem script for ensemble performances, and documentary video portraits of Sharon Bridgeford, Magdalena Gomez, Vic Quesada, and myself, Nicole M. Young. In 2018, Kiro Volver was produced at the Academy of Music Theater in Northampton, Massachusetts by grassroots organizers in Smith College and raised over $10,000 to support immigrant justice initiatives. Diana and I have collaborated on a lot of projects in the region, including as far as Troy, New York. Many of you know her as one of my closest friends. To me, she's family. So I couldn't think of a better person to help us kick off this evening other than with Dr. Chicona herself. Immediately following their chat, we will host a Q&A with those who are joining us this evening. To pose a question, either type your question in the comments field here on Facebook Live or email the questions to me at the address you'll see below. During the conversation, feel free to sing the praises of both artists via the comments fields of Facebook Live. Before we turn over to tonight's conversation with Diana and Amina, I would love to give the floor to Amina to perform some works for us so that you can get a sense of the writing that this amazing performer, poet, performer, writer has. So let's give a very warm welcome to poet performer, 2020 Straw Dog Writers Guild Emerging Writer Fellow, and the fellow for the inaugural year, Amina Nia Ellipsis Jordan Mendez. Hi, everybody. Um, Nicole, thank you so much for literally everything. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for creating this opportunity. Thank you for such a beautiful and amazing introduction. Um, and thank you for everything that you do um, for artists as a poet, of course, for poets, um, being a beautiful and wonderful poet and artist yourself, but just for every everyone in the whole community of artists. Thank you so much, Nicole. Um, yes, it has been a really beautiful experience so far to be the Straw Dog Fellow. I'm feeling extremely held by these two women um, that have so graciously um, believed in me, motivated me and inspired me um, with their own works. And then also by, you know, putting their hands on my shoulders. So 
thank you so much for all of that and the big introduction. Um, I'm a blessed and honored to share some work with you tonight. Um, poetry has always been my outlet and I think it always will be. Uh, I, I have been processing a lot of what's happened over the past few years um, and especially obviously in the past mm -hmm. few weeks through my art that has definitely helped me to stay balanced and I'm happy to share some of my new works with you all today. Uh, these are both two new pieces. Um, and without further ado, I'd love to get into it. So I will be reading from my laptop here because they are so new. <laughs> um, I'm happy to share them with you. And here we go. Mom, I'm sorry for missing the bus all those times. I'm sorry the spiders in my bed got the best of me, coiling the blankets tight around me me filled with a euphoric venom stagnant and safe on a dinner plate I recognize. The bus was a scary place. Far too many eyes on far too many faces, faces prettier than mine, faces slimmer than mine, faces more confident, more together, smarter, whiter, judging faces more brutal than mine. I felt if I must be watched constantly, let it be by my own two eyes and the spiders in my head. Let me pick apart and steep in my findings, a piece of stale bread living a second life in a bowl of minestrone. I know the dangers of being alone far better than those of the big wide world. And still, mom, I know you wanted your rest too. I know the spiders in your room sought to cling you to walls and TVs and pillows. Curtains pulled and covers heavy over full thoughts linger as nests, eggs in the air, and grief so much to process. And I couldn't get myself to school. I'm sorry that we couldn't tackle our unwelcome guests together. As Frodo and Sam, swords and vials of ethereal glittering magic, our spiders hissing, climbing over one another to attack and retreat, and we back to back smirk across our faces, cloaked and hooded, triumphant before the dawn. We'd have breakfast, we'd have coffee and tea, we'd set intentions for the day, for the week, we'd hug and kiss goodbye, I'd get on the bus, Careful not to knock the judgmental bitches in the head with my sword. You take some time before the day, knocking cobwebs out of the corners of your room, shooing spiders from beneath your head. So that's my first piece um, that I wrote. I, I work with young people now. Um, and I work mostly in the public school system, um, primarily in Holyoke, but I do venture to Amherst, Northampton, Springfield. Um, and I think that day I had been dealing with a particularly sluggish student who was usually so full of energy and that day they were just completely, you know, not themselves and it kind of reminded me of me, you know, when my mom had to kind of had to drag me to go to this school building to be with these people that I didn't necessarily feel like were for me. Um, and so that really inspired me because I know that there are still so many mental health issues between students and entire families that can make school a really difficult place. So that's where the inspiration for that piece came from. Um, and this next piece is inspired by one of my favorite artists named Gil Scott Heron. Um, Many of you probably know that name. One of his most popular pieces is called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. Uh, I actually just shared this piece for the first time with some of my young people in a remote meeting earlier. And I had to play one of his songs so that people kind of knew um, his vocal style of performing poems. Um, so I'll definitely be um, paying homage to Gil Scott Heron in this piece. Um, and honestly, a little bit of Dr. Seuss. <laughs> um, but it is called, I am not a thing to be hurt in honor of all of the people of color that we've lost to senseless police brutality. Um, so I am not a thing to be hurt, inspired by the stylings of Gil Scott Heron. 
I am not a thing to be hurt, not a worm in the dirt, not a swift buzzard fly, not a penny. I am not a thing to be worked, corkscrew or red brick, luxurious poached fur or a person on last dollar. I am not none of that there, though to be good and fair, those are things not deserved to be hurt either. I am not a truck, not a moat, not an egg scrambled or poached, not rotten or refuse. You're just used to having things stuck in the corner of your eye. You confuse my black life for your ghosts. The point of a pin, a thin hair's moment when you collide into my picture. I am not a goat or a sock, not whole countries or stock, not a badge on a taxi or murderer. Just a sweet living thing trying and trying to get over caught in the corner of your eye. I am not an addict or unlearned, not an immigrant worker or kidnapped child. That is to say, none of us, not a single strum of us deserve to be hurt in order to feed rat, bull, or reptile. We are not none of that there, none of that there, none of those childhood toys or food games. Not twisted, vicious coming of age, manhood team with pride coming off the backs of dead men. Not your deep seated guilt, lip quiver and quip all that pomp and circumstance. Your tears and actionless care are as plastic wrap and magnifying glass, weak and see through and incriminating too, to watch you self serve to trauma as you watch me die through half drawn curtains. No, we are none of those things, not a nut or a screw or a mirror for you, nor your car, your purse or your soul. We are not a worm in the dirt seeds or a dream that you have the right to keep burying us. We are not your problem. We are not a problem and never in need of correction. Not an undisciplined child or animal in the wild, not a thing to be hurt at all. I am a human, a person, a woman with breath, wondering why is your list of things to be hurt so damn long and so damn tall. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to share my pieces with you all today. I would love any and all feedback and thank you for having me. And thank you, Nicole and Deanna. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> oh my goodness. All I could do was respond in that way as I was listening to you, Amina. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful work. Uh, powerful. It was work that resonated in the skin, you know, in, in the body. And I really appreciated listening to that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Chingona Diana Alvarez, and I'm going to be having a chat with Amina Jordan Mendez, the inaugural fellow for the Straw Dog um, Emerging Writers Fellowship. It is my honor and privilege to be here with you, Amina and to listen to your work. Um, and, and to be honest, I had questions for you as, I, as you know that I sketched out, but as I was listening to you, I was taking notes and just thinking of other things um, to ask. Um, the first thing I want to ask you actually has to do with the last poem that you just read, um, I Am Not a Thing to Be Hurt. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanna know what, you feel is the role of pronouncement in poems and in mm -hmm. art because what you are doing what i heard you do was you know just a clear pronouncement repeated mm -hmm. and musical and mm -hmm. rhythmic and as i said it, it was like a poem for the skin for the body because i was moving with it and responding with it and I'd love to know what you think the role of pronouncement is for art and for activists and for people who, who teach and mm. for us mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that is a great, great question. Um, I think that it's been something that I naturally am drawn to in my writing, mm -hmm. um, partially because of the long history of pronouncement in spoken word poetry, but also in all spoken um, um, cultures, really. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is something to be said for proclaiming that I think 
is the root of saying, I'm pronouncing this thing. It means that you claim that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that when it comes to, you know, whether it be spiritual work or organizational work or personal work, the more that you say something or propaganda, right? <laughs> the more that you say something, um, and the more that you claim that thing, the more real, the more true it becomes. Mm -hmm. And I know that for me, and in regards to this poem in particular, I was having a hard time. I was having a hard time writing, actually, um, when all of the protests and everything first started. And I was wondering why that is, why that is. And I think part of it is because an event like this does make us question. It does make us question our safety, our humanity. Um, why it's so difficult for others sometimes to see our humanity. Mm -hmm. And I found that I needed a piece that would state that, that would claim that, and that would really unapologetically say, this is a true thing. This is my truth. And this is a truth that someone needs to hear and understand. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the role of pronouncement in writing and performing is really saying, no, this is not up for discussion. This is not you know, a question, it's not a wonder, it's this, this is what it is. And that's why we chant in protests. And that's why we chant in spiritual, you know, moments. And that's why we have a uh, um, call and response in many Afrocentric cultures. Mm -hmm. That's why we have the storytelling that, you know, pulls you in and whispers because you have to hear, you have to know, you have to claim that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a very powerful tool. And I think just as important, as pronouncement is, the absence of pronouncement can be just as powerful to show vulnerability as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's beautiful, thank you. Yeah, I couldn't help but to, to note that down and just, and just underline it, you know, the act of declaring um, directly and clearly, you know, and that came through beautifully in this poem. So I'm so happy that you shared it. Um, and the other, the, the first piece you read, what was the title of it again? Um, so I am actually still thinking of a title. Um, right now, I have it kind of like a spiders on the bus. <laughs> yeah, spiders just really like, oh, what a powerful, what a, so complex an image. Mm. Um, I'm curious to know about your thoughts on the role of mothering to liberation. Mm. Um, I'll leave it there. I just, I had like resonance of intergenerational healing. Mm -hmm. um, and just from your, you know, like on social media, I've seen you celebrate your mother and I, I'd love to hear, yeah, your thoughts on mothering to liberation. Yes, yes. Oh my gosh. Big shout outs to mom. <laughs> Her usual. So many moms around the world deserve these big shout outs. Um, yeah, I think my mother um, mothered me the very best that she could. And that was amazing. <laughs> you know, she was an amazing mother. And I think that um, when we think about mothering to liberation, we think about how we um, inspire and set up our children. We think about how we show that we believe in them, how we feed and nourish their ideas and their questions, mm -hmm. um, all of which my mother did, all of which most mothers and parents and anybody in that um, um, position in a child's life does. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is this other element of, like you said, that intergenerational kind of trauma, um, those intergenerational um, injustices that we do remember in our bodies um, and in the ways that we were mothered. Mm -hmm. So in this poem, I'm really thinking about how we're both amazing women now. We both have always been amazing women and girls. Um, and that the ways that our mental health challenges kept us from achieving rest was something that was felt in our household. Mm -hmm. um, so I was never ready in the mornings. I just wasn't ready to leave the house. I wasn't um, prepared mentally or spiritually or emotionally to, as I saw it, be fed to the sharks, right? Um, and on the flip side, my mom was like, please, like, please just go take yourself to school so that I can have, you know, the hour and a half that I need to get ready 
to face my world. Um, and a big part of her world was being able to provide for us, right? For me in the most basic of ways, food, shelter, water, right? Um, and love and all of the things that she also managed to do amazingly. So when I think of mothering liberation, I do think of the, the larger scale things that my mom was able to do, like talk to me about, you know, black identity, Afro-Latinx identity, uh, poverty, um, I'm sorry, poor people's rights, workers' rights, everything that we've talked about, you know, um, mm -hmm. honoring worldwide cultures and not just your own. Um, but then also that delicate balance between your own personal interactions and your own ways of taking care of yourself and one another. Um, because even our relationships are reflective of, of, of the systems of oppression that you've experienced. You know, it's easy sometimes to focus all on work, 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 work and not take care of yourself or fall back from feeling like you can do things because people tell you that you can't, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's beautiful because, you know, a lot of in my own work, I focus a lot on motherlessness um, mm -hmm. and building family. And it's a beautiful just moment to listen to you speak about mothering and liberation and to speak about um you know, the things that get passed down and the things that get left out, you know, and it's, it is rhythmic, you know, I always think about rhythm and how, how um, we miss some beats and we collect others, right? Um, I, I was thinking about your bio, you know, the, the section where you talk about uh, growing up in this area in Western Massachusetts. And I wrote down fat, black, queer, no, rebel, black, fat, queer, and existing. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I love it. And I'm, and you have also um, spoken about Afro-Latinidad as well. So I'm, I'm curious to know about um, you holding all of that space in this particular area and what that experience has been for you as a creative person, as an expansive writer in this area um yeah it i i always felt like a rebel as i was growing up um because i think that's just my natural personality that's what i you know <laughs> that's just kind of my uh how i prefer to believe in myself um yes. when I was a kid mm -hmm. i was like i'm probably gonna be a skateboarder I'm gonna do <laughs> People don't think I'm gonna do, <laughs> you know, I was always tomboy, everything. So I always considered myself a rebel. Um, and as I grew up more and more and more, I realized, okay, are you a rebel? Like check, yes. But also are you a rebel um, or are you just yourself? Are you just fat, black, queer and alive? Mm -hmm. and do those things just automatically make you a rebel because there are, so many pieces to you that most of the people around you can't quite um, understand or grapple with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so that was definitely something that I realized growing up that if, if someone was going to see me, you know, solely as the angry or the wild or the depressed black girl, then sure. If that's all that they're going to see of me, then make it a show, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and as I grew, as I continue to grow up, you know, we're all still growing. As I continue to grow up, I realized that um, this magnifying glass, you know, this really pointed and directed attention that is on um, Black youth, to be strange, to be messed up, to be at risk, to be um, dangerous, to be misunderstood um, is not a narrative that others have the right to place on you. Mm -hmm. uh, that if you are to claim those things and you very well might want to, um, that it's up to you to say what your story is, to say what your narrative is. Um, and growing up, I felt like while I did claim some of those things, a lot of them were lofted onto me um, mm -hmm. and became 
ways for me to perpetuate this kind of negative and oversimplified story of myself. So it has been a lot of peeling back the layers of what Amherst taught me um, about myself, of what Northampton taught me about myself, of what Holyoke has taught me about myself. It has been a lot of really saying, okay, well, how do I show up in these spaces that's authentic to my soul, to my, my being, to my desires and to my humanity? Um, and if there's someone who feels like they need to oversimplify me, that doesn't actually stop me and it also doesn't direct me or guide me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think being an educator in this area has very much empowered me with that foresight. Mm -hmm. Because when I think of the young people that are dealing with these types of stereotypes that are being flung on them, you know, whether it be by teachers or neighbors or people at the store, store clerks, you know, um, I want them to know that while these things might still be true, that they do have a right and they do have um, the power to live a completely different narrative than what someone might place on them. Mm -hmm. So that, that has definitely made my experience as an artist and as an artist educator um, very, very complex. Mm -hmm. And I can see the connection between your teaching and your performance work back to, you know, why you find declaration to be so powerful, right? Mm -hmm. To claim, to claim all of the honest parts of you and your humanity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it seems, one of the things that it, I am listening to and, and hearing is that um, lineage is really important to you. I know that you've expressed to me that teaching is really important to you. So would you like to speak more about that? Your, your role as a teacher and um, what you love about it, what brings you joy there? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so it definitely is, it feels like a bittersweet thing to talk about because I haven't been able to teach in person in a while and I'm definitely missing it. <laughs> definitely, definitely missing it. <laughs> um, but I, I found, um, you know how they have that little diagram that's like what you're good at, what you love to do and what you can be paid for. And it's like, <laughs> perfect in the middle, whatever. <laughs> Um, I have felt that working with young people is, is that, is that thing for me. Um, mm -hmm. while I am a very passionate poet and, um, this is also something, you know, of course, that I pour myself into, even my poetry, I think about through the guise of young people, um, and specifically young people in marginalized communities, um, whether that be class-based or race-based, mm -hmm. um, that is really who I think of when I think um, about using my poetry to empower, mm -hmm. to energize, and to hold, just to hold. Mm -hmm. um, I love, 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 love teaching and facilitating. Um, I mostly call it facilitating, to be honest, because what I do is I really focus on how to get young people energized and almost activated mm. in their own learning and passion. Um, yes, yes, <laughs> what a beautiful way of expressing that. Right, I should write that down. <laughs> but yeah, this is gonna be recorded, so it's good. Yeah, activate, yeah, thinking about that as activating in the classroom. And then I was like, we gotta teach a workshop together. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we will. Um, yeah, because, I, I don't feel like I'm, especially because I'm talking about privilege, oppression, power, mm -hmm. I'm talking about um, systems of inequality, I'm talking about Afrofuturism, I'm talking about envisioning a new world where young people don't have to ask permission to speak. I'm thinking about mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. like, we're like I'm like, we're all in here. So what are we doing today? You know, so yeah. I, I, I mm -hmm. hesitate to call myself a teacher and consider myself more of a facilitator because there's already so much rich knowledge mm -hmm. um, and experiences in the room with young people that I really just am really very passionate about bringing out. Um, I'm really passionate about young people 
hearing grown-ups talk and not feeling like they're being dismissed. I'm really passionate about young people feeling like when they go to an organization that's meant to be for them, that they feel they have the right to ask for changes mm -hmm. and to bring up ideas and to um, question things. I'm really passionate about that. I think that um, while we have had male-centered leadership, we also have had adult-centered leadership um, mm -hmm. in, in many ways across across the board. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm very passionate about youth leadership, and I think a lot of that starts with youth advocacy. Mm -hmm. So even when I'm in the classroom or at a community center um, talking about, you know, maybe just like simply an intro to poetry, you know, we're strictly talking about poetry. <laughs> Um, I understand that it's also important to talk about like, okay, so how have you all experienced being silenced in your lives? Mm -hmm. How is you writing a form of liberating your voice, a form of liberating these ideas and beliefs that people haven't given you the time or space to share? How is you journaling uh, your commitment to not believing that you deserve to be silenced? Mm -hmm. How is that also a way for you to process all the things that happen to you throughout the day where you are teaching yourself? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that workshops and, you know, residences, residencies, pardon, and um, just being a teaching artist and a facilitator in that way is really fulfilling for me. Because um, you're right, that lineage, I want to, I, I want to, know that the young people behind me are, are good, are confident, are strong in believing in themselves. Yeah, and I'm a firm believer that we should have mentors who are younger than us, you know, mm -hmm. that every generation should. And I feel that, you know, when you frame yourself as a facilitator, that's what you're doing. You're creating a space to be taught as well. Right, um, right. Or, or creating a learning environment, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Um, I want to turn to you and your vision for yourself. And, and when I'm asking these questions, I want you to think about your joy, your ecstasy, your liberation, right? So what do you envision for yourself as a writer, as a performer, as an artist, you know, in terms of like all the things that you could do, all the expansive ways that you could grow? What do you envision? Mm. Um. This is a very exciting question because <laughs> I think we all <laughs> I think we all should do more to to vision without limits. Yeah. Um, and to say this is what I would like to have happen and this is what can happen and this is what I'm going to make happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's also um a little bit I don't want to say scary but it's a little bit like whew, all right, you know, like here we go. Mm -hmm. Um because it is such an unclear road for so many artists, mm -hmm. um, just because so many of us are blazing our own trail into, into spaces that we know exist and into um, you know recognition that we know exists, for example, um, but not necessarily how to get there. <laughs> yep. um, so if we're visioning without limits, I really, I do love to travel. I love, 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 love traveling. Um, well, I'll say I love being new places. Traveling itself is kind of stressful. <laughs> um, <laughs> the planes and the tickets, and the, oh, it's a lot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I yeah. do love going new places. And I would love to bring my poetry with me when I go new places and mm -hmm. have people around the world um, that want to hear me and that want to create community with me um, and that feel that my voice and my art is a sturdy and a trustworthy and a truthful contribution to their communities. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely do envision um, being able to tour the world one yes. day, um, being able to say, oh, you know, I now get to turn around and support my artist community in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. um, in India, in China, any, you know, in South Africa. Um, and really, yeah. um, if globalization is to be real, then let there be a global 
a network of artists as well, you know, that are strong and informed and supportive of one another. So mm -hmm. that is definitely um, one of my limitless visions. Um, I really look forward to publishing. Mm -hmm. I really look forward to uh, being able to be one of those poets that I was able to benefit from, uh, reading on the bus, you know, reading a poem that really touched me or made me feel alive or made me feel heard. So whatever I had to deal with that day um, didn't seem so isolating or didn't seem so dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. I would really love to be one of those books that someone has on their bookshelf and it's like that book right there, you know, that, that mm -hmm. book helped me find my passion, that book um, helps me feel safe. That book, you know, that's auntie type of, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, <laughs> what I listened to tonight, I mean, you are that poet, you know, like I, I need to sit through those poems more, you know, again and again. Um, I want to, were you finished? Did you have more to say there? Um, no, those are, it, it all branches from there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I know we were given the five minute uh, from our wonderful, beautiful host. Um, I wanna just ask you quickly to, to tell us how we can support your thriving and your joy in this world and on, our, on your and our path to liberation. How can we support your thriving mm. as an artist and human? Yeah, um, I think one of the first things that comes to mind when I think of being supported as a as a surviving and thriving Afro-Latinx artist. Um, I, I um, especially right now, especially right now, um, it is painful um, to, to feel that um, my humanity and that of my family and my people um, is so often threatened or questioned even indirectly. And I think that in order to support artists of color, um, LGBTQ artists of color, um, that we are all, myself included, um, really able and willing to be present um, through hard conversations that ask us, um, how do we benefit from someone else's pain? Um, I think at this time, it is very encouraging to know um, my people and my allies are finding ways to shake off um, lifestyles and certain beliefs and even certain phrases or shopping at certain places that aren't aligned with the world that we need to create going forward. Mm -hmm. um, so whether that be, you know, really committing to having that Black Lives Matter sticker on your car or mm -hmm. the sign on your door or jumping in when you hear a really inappropriate sexist, racist or classist joke or, you know, just yep. really thinking about the daily things that we can do every day to continue supporting humanity. Um, I know that that type of energy is very strong mm -hmm. um, and and as an empath, I think that would do a lot to heal so many of these empathic artists in the world right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I, um, I really do want people to continue listening to children, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, listening to children, apologizing to children, um, congratulating children, not interrupting children when they speak. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I think that's incredibly important in that same vein of supporting humanity. Um, they're humans too, right? And they do have rights. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, yeah, I'm, I'm really blessed and honored to have people who want to engage with my art. So keep engaging with my art. Um, send me emails, send me questions, send me, send me events, send me feedback. Um, I'm, I'm very much a community poet. Um, I really look forward to writing with others, to sharing with others. So I think that um, helps me to thrive a lot as well. Yeah, all of that. Thank you. Thank you. So 
I mean, I just, I just have to say, if ever people wonder how to support a thriving independent artist, um, expansive in her existence, this uh, Amina Jordan Mendez just told us how. Um, so thank you, Amina. Thank you for the power of your words, the rhythm, the beauty, um, the ways that you reach us. You know, in in the body and very with so much intention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Happy to be here. Yay. <laughs> Nicole, <laughs> I'm waiting for Nicole. She says she's going to start the Q&A. Yay. Here I am. I'm back. Woo! So we're going to go ahead and start the Q&A. I did get a couple of questions from attendees during your little conversation, which the conversation was extremely powerful and amazing. And I couldn't think of two people, two other people who could have had that type of conversation. So thank you so much. So the first question I have is who are writers that inspire you, Amina? It could be a poet, novelist, playwright. Um, who inspires you and why? Mm -hmm. um, that is such a great question. I, I always love that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> because I am absolutely one of those people that I find that um, most of my most, most of my most, most of my really kind of like radical, almost foundational inspiration um, in terms of writers are usually novelists um, and uh, journalists. So I would say um, some of my very favorite writers are James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, Ida B. Wells, and um, someone I'm reading right now is Denez Smith. Um, I've definitely mentioned them a couple times in some of our emails even. Um, <laughs> I actually just reached out to them too. I was like, how do you do what you do? You're amazing. <laughs> um, so that is kind of who I'm fangirling over at the moment. Um, and the reason for that is um, I think that James Baldwin, and Ida B. Wells are some of the best journalists that I've ever witnessed. Um, obviously Ida B. Wells is way, way back in the day, right? Um, <laughs> but I think she really opened the door for so many other black journalists and writers to really unapologetically and unflinchingly uh, face the issues that they themselves and their community were dealing with in really beautiful and poignant ways um, and brave, very brave ways too. Um, so I'm, I'm really proud of them as writers and as creators and the, the things that they were able to leave behind for people to continue to build with and grow from. And Tony, oh, um, if anyone hasn't seen I Am Not Your Negro yet by James, not by James Baldwin, um, but the sort of like documentary on James Baldwin's work, please do check it out, it's amazing. Um, and also uh, Toni Morrison as one of my writers does have a similar thing out um, called The Pieces That I Am. I think it's called The Pieces That I Am. Mm -hmm. Absolutely beautiful um, testament to ancestral knowledge, to really being, um, grounded in her body and her experience as a woman, a mother, a person of color, a writer, um, and a community writer. You know, she worked for a publishing company that really helped so many other writers get their voices as well, um, or be heard, rather. They always had their voices, but be heard. Um, and so I'm proud of the writer that she is, not only because of the amazing things that she writes, but because of the type of writer, the type of person that she was and how infused those two identities really were. Um, one of my favorite quotes, or not uh, necessarily a quote, but she did an exercise, I think, where she wrote, okay, what are all the things that I have to do? It said, go to the grocery store, mother my child, mow the lawn, cook dinner, edit this book, blah, 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 you know, this whole long list. And then she said, okay, make another list, what do I need to do? Mm. And she said, mother my child and write. And so I really think that um, 
that just commitment to being a writer, to being an artist, to believing that your writing is not only your life force, but someone else's life force, that's really beautiful to me. Um, and Danette Smith, because, oh, wow. <laughs> I, for a while, had forgotten how rich and delicious metaphors truly can be when you um, don't think about it too hard. You know, when you really just let your feelings speak for you and try not to make too much of it, it ends up being so much more um, than, than you might have planned for it to be. Um, not saying that is their process, but that mm -hmm. is what reading their writing has awakened in me over the past year or so. Oh, the next question that I have for you is, what blocks, obstacles, or new directions you hope to address in your work and how will this better your poetry? Mm. Um, yeah, I think um, one of the biggest obstacles that I have found um, previously um, is really being almost so much of an ethereal kind of artist that I could just sit around and write poetry all day. <laughs> um, <laughs> and often finding myself stuck in that, okay, what is, what is, the, what is the next step? Um, what are the legal next steps? What are the logistic next steps? What are um, the, the ways that I can connect and support other voices while also being sure that I contribute to this you know, growing um, um, or this revival really of, of young people and adults in poetry you know how how do i join this really global conversation um that is outside of just creating poems um and you know having forms here and there or having sharings here and there you know how do i really uh how do i show up on this global platform in a way that is true to me um so that has been a block and an obstacle um and I know that this program has already helped um, because of the ways that I've been able to talk to Diana about, you know, I, I was able to just be brave and just say like, I don't really know, <laughs> you know, just say, I, I would like to publish, but, <laughs> um, and just feeling, you know, like, like, okay, well now I have the, the time, the space, you know, this dedicated space with, amazing supporters, you know, Nicole and Deanna, um, who are, are going to be like, okay, just let's talk about it. Let's just talk about it. You know, instead of being like, okay, well, do you know the the copyright code yet? Or do you have you, what is, which one has been published? How, you know, none of that. It's just like, let's start from the beginning. Um, and that has been really incredibly helpful for me um, as an emerging artist. <laughs> nice. And then, um, there was a question. There's one last question for you, Amina. Next, there was a question directed to me. So the last question to Amina: What advice? And this is actually a question I came up with. Um, what advice do you have for the next Afro Latinx poet performer? Ooh, wow, that is a great question. What advice do I have? Um, I want to say, write and perform what you feel needs to be written and performed. There are so many ways in which each of our very complex identities can be captured in writing and different audiences will appreciate and react to different things and that everything you have to write and everything you have to say is true and valid and important, even when you have no audience in mind at all. I think that as a performer, it can get really easy to think so much about the audience mm -hmm. and not so much about what your heart and your ancestors are telling you, and that we do need to remember for our own health and well-being that our art forms are for us first. Thank you for that. Um, thank you so much, 
Amina and Diana so much for mm -hmm. an amazing, an amazing, an amazing chat this evening. Mm -hmm. So before we close for the evening, I'm going to share a little bit of information on um, the organization itself that brought to you this event. And also a little bit of information about ourselves, the three artists that were featured this evening. So to learn more about Straw Dog Writers Guild, you can visit our website at www.strawdogwriters.org. And to donate to Straw Dog Writers Guild, you can visit our website and then go to um, FunDrive. That direct link is www.strawdogwritersguild.org slash fun hyphen drive. To learn more about the artists that were featured this evening, including myself and Diana, um, Amina is on Instagram at Ellipsis Speaks. Dr. Diana Alvarez is at www.diana-alvarez.com, social media at Brana Wana. And then myself, I am at www.nicolemyoung.com. And on social media, I am at Coco underscore pen explore. And then the last part before we close out this evening is this is how to support our guests. You could support them by um, donating cash directly to them. This is Amina's cash app name. And then this is Dr. Diana Alvarez's information via PayPal and also Venmo. So I want to thank everyone again. We are at eight o'clock. We're at the top of the show this evening. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. I want to give a special shout out again to Amina and Diana for tonight's very engaging discussion. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. Many of you um, hung on. Thank you so much for the hour. I want to give a very special shout out to Laura Stone, Administrative Director for Straw Dog Writers Guild, and Ella Alkowitz, who is our social media manager who also served as one of the judges for moderating the comments this evening. So everyone, thank you again for coming. Be well, sending you all virtual hugs, love, support, patience um, as we get through this very, very, very challenging time. Thank you so much for joining us.